Hello and welcome to Minds of Mountain Film. I'm Maya Albanese and I'm here today with Grant McCargo, founder and managing director of Biological Capital, described as a land investment, development, revitalization, and conservation company. Grant has more than 20 years experience in sustainable developments. Grant, thank you for being with us here today at Minds of Mountain Film. My pleasure. So development and investment and conservation, uh, these ideas may be seen as contradictory. So could you please let us know how biological capital is successfully merging these ideas? Yes, I've spent my whole career looking at human settlement patterns. And I focused the first part of my career looking at urban areas with the world population going to eight or nine billion. We've got to make the cities really wonderful. And they, ha they are now. New York City was bankrupt when I got out of college. Um, the neighborhoods in Denver I worked in, you wouldn't walk in in the middle of the day 25 years ago. South of Market San Francisco, a hip part of town, was not a place you thought of living. Today, those are dynamic cities. Now what's threatened is the suburban and rural areas. And the world's not going to stop growing for the foreseeable next 100 years. So how do we look as humans and live on that land and not do the industrial model of extraction, but put more in than we take out. So to answer your question, we have to find a model of ecology and commerce and how our human settlement patterns are working with nature versus against. So the conversation is really hot right now, specifically about the profit aspect and uh, social entrepreneurship and how a company can go after profit, but also make a positive social or environmental difference. Um, how is biological capital becoming profitable but not losing sight of the, the social and environmental mission behind it? Well, uh, that's a tension that's a lot of existing companies. So let's just say you had a company that's been making, let's take Coca-Cola, making a product for 100 years, water and sugar basically. So they're focusing on sustainability about a problem they see versus biologicals actually designed as a company with a mission of community, ecology, and commerce and how they can all work together. So we work in places that by bringing back sustainable agriculture, we're creating jobs, and we're doing it in a way that's entrepreneurship. So if you live in a remote ag town right now, there's limited opportunities with the industrial model of one guy in a big tractor driving versus ours is mimicking nature. So we have a lot of people in the landscape and they're not just growing food, they're actually creating products, value added products and integrating their experiences, not only about the growing food, but the entrepreneurship side of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a conflict with profit and sociability. In fact, you'll be more successful in a community if you create that culture of doing good. And if it's good for us, and it's good for the community, and it's good for nature, then we have a three-way winning solution. So for companies, the old guerrilla corporations out there that may not have had um, such a altruistic mission ingrained in its original mission, you know, what can they do to steer their direction now, you know, like the Coca-Colas of the world? Um, you know, what would you recommend to them to, to make a positive difference? You know, business is about solving a problem usually, or it's about developing a product that people will find useful in their daily lives. And I think the shift that's happening right now is that people care where it comes from. So this whole local food movement, it isn't a fad, it's a long-term trend. People care what goes in their body. So companies are now adapting to what the market's demanding for it. What I'm excited to see is corporations taking the lead and not waiting for the public policy changes that should be happening, but saying, you know what? Our customers are demanding that, or our shareholders are demanding that. And that's something that I'm excited to be seeing happening. So uh, Grant, you were also a featured speaker specifically on the topic of sustainable agriculture and conventional food systems. So I was wondering if you could sum up for us, you know, why are we harvesting our food in a way now that's contributing to climate change? What, what are the problems that we're facing? Well, what happened after World War II, um, the Germans actually invented a lot of um, herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers during the war periods of how to feed more people um, with less land and less resources. And that model sort of trickled into a broader ag strategy after World War II. What we didn't know though, by putting these man-made things on the land, we were extracting more and more out of the soil. Changing our ag practices is probably the biggest impact we can have on climate. 8% of the carbon footprint from agricultural practices. Let's take livestock. 
And I love talking about this because if you look back 400 years ago, we had more bison in North America than we have cows today. Hmm. And a lot of the, what I call conventional ag thinkers, the last 50, 70 years saying, we can't grow enough um, livestock grass fed. We have to do a corn fed base. Well, that's not true. Remember what I said, we had as many bison as we have of uh, cows today, but they were grass fed and we had no methane problem 400 years ago because the bison were actually carbon sink uh, creatures. The way they grazed in a mob grazing to protect themselves from predators um, created this incredible soil building. All the topsoil in the plains of our country came from the bison. And unfortunately, the last 70 years, we've lost a lot of that. Let's take the corn industry. You might get 10,000 pounds of corn per acre off a good yielding year in Iowa. What they don't tell you is that that industrial monoculture loses 20,000 pounds per acre per, um, per year to get that 10,000. So we've now had 50, 60, 70 years of this industrial monoculture that is taking away our topsoil. And now it's not as healthy as productive. It also relates to water. Every 1% of organic matter on an acre of land holds 16,000 gallons of water. So we've lost 80% of our organic matter, our topsoil, we've lost this natural sponge. So a lot of the flooding or a lot of the drought conditions are related to how we've managed the biological health of our soil. So what we need to do is not wait for technology to find solutions, but actually look at nature. And how would nature have solved this problem? If we go back to the bison story and practice that same grazing practice, which we call grass-fed cows today, you know, doing grass-fed beef, that actually was not, not take away, but actually put back into the soil. And cows were made to eat grass, not corn. Part of the methane problem is cows feel sick when they're eating corn. If they're out in grass eating diverse grasses, not just one product of corn, it's actually helping their health system. A cow barely lasts a week in a feedlot without some kind of uh, antibiotics. Mm. You don't see the bison getting antibiotics. It's, they were part of nature. If you look at a, at a natural field or a natural prairie, you don't need to put pesticides, herbicides. It's that diversity that creates that dynamic part of life. What we need to do is look at all those models and make those shifts today to mimic nature. And agriculture is the fastest one we can reduce our carbon footprint because it's a growing season. If we change our grazing practices and our lifestyle practices next year, we'd immediately see an impact on that. If we started going to, instead of industrial monoculture, doing hundreds of different uh, plants and species per acre, we now mimic nature on that di di diversity. So we don't need to do the pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers. And that also is building topsoil. Agriculture is one of my favorite topics because that's what we can shift on an annual basis. Every growing season, there's a chance to do it differently. Uh, the livestock example is a, is a really good one. Um, could you give us an example of a project that Biological Capital is working on where you're implementing these kinds of um, shifts in agriculture and paradigm shifts? Sure. Um, Hawaii is one of the places we're working right now. And Hawaii has more natural resources than probably anywhere else on the planet. But they, today, they're importing 92% of their food and over 90% of their energy. And we're working on those two things as one of our main focus. So let's talk about agriculture. They've done industrial pineapple and sugarcane for the last 100 years in a plantation model. And they're not competitive anymore for multiple reasons. One is the energy costs are high there. Two is they've ruined the soil health so much by doing the same crop over and over. It requires so much inputs of fertilizers to make that product grow. So what we're doing is taking those fallow pineapple and sugarcane fields now and per turning it into biointensive gardens, growing food. And we've been able, instead of making 10,000, create 10,000 pounds per acre, in that example in Iowa, we're getting 35 to 50,000 pounds per acre because of this biointense garden style. And on top of that, no pesticides, no herbicides, and now we have diversity. So Nature does have cycles that go through, but when you have that many different crops, you're not gonna be wiped out by all of it. So it's, so it's really fun to see our changes of how much food we're creating. Our goal is to show models that Hawaii can be self-sufficient for food. Hawaii went for a thousand years off the indigenous population growing its own food, totally self-sufficient. Wow. But in 70 years, they've gotten so that they import 92%. 
Same thing on energy we're doing there too. Hawaii is a place that has the trade winds and wind and sun year round. It's incredible. Renewables is a tremendous opportunity to do in that state. And is the trend that you're describing in Hawaii, um, the majority of energy and food being imported, something we see across the entire globe? Or is Hawaii a specific example that you chose because there's more of an issue with importation of resources? Or, you know, for example, Telluride, um, what, what's the case here? And, and, and is every, should every community be following the Hawaii model? They should be. We need to get back to a mo mode of decentralized energy. Telluride should be growing its energy here. It has wind, it has sun. Right now, it's mostly coal coming here on a transmission line. Very silly. Mm -hmm. Same with agriculture. The valley floor here could, could have a series of greenhouses that could produce a lot of the basic greens and fruits and vegetables year round. Um, so this model can work anywhere. Hawaii's been fun to work in because it's so extreme of how dependent it's got. And being one of the most geographically remote places on the planet, it's at crisis level. Think mm -hmm. if it got shut off for some reason of supply, there's only a 10 day supply of food in Hawaii. Wow. And how uh, disastrous that be if for some reason those supplies got cut off. But Telluride, California, New England. New England, 100 years ago, used to get lettuce in the wintertime. It didn't come from the Central Valley, California on a truck across the country. They had greenhouses that were solar powered. Solar meaning they were built into the ground, so you had the, the heat of the 55 degree earth no matter what time of year it is outside, and glass. With no other heating, they were growing greens year-round in Boston. So it's almost as if to make progress we have to rewind a bit. Sounds like with some of the things we were doing in the past were more efficient than what we're doing now. And mix it in with technology. The world used to be de decentralized, and because of cheap energy, we were able to decentralize that. And now we need to, I mean, we centralize it all, now we need to decentralize it. And Think about the footprint of transportation costs and jobs. All those things growing locally makes a huge thing. And it also reminds people, so much of our children today forget where food comes from. Mm. And if they saw food growing locally, their connection to it would be very different. What's the next big move for biological capital and what is the long-term vision for the company? Our goal is to demonstrate that by mixing, taking the non-silo model, how do we mix renewable energy, with agriculture and water and look at new human settlement communities that are walkable and that have a sense of place, that you live your daily life on foot, um, to build a series of these kind of communities and demonstrate that they're better models for, for the community itself, for the planet from an ecological standpoint, and equally important to be sustainable is it's a better business model. So let's take a sample of one of our projects right now. Um, it may be a 10,000 acre watershed sized landscape. Um, renewable energy, maybe wind and sun, will be our, one of our first uses on that property. Then we'll bring in agriculture. A uh, wind turbine doesn't take up any real estate. It's got a tiny little pole. So you can still grows, uh, graze livestock underneath it. We can still have farms underneath it. Um, and then how do we connect water to those things? Um, what people forget about agriculture, the big drivers are energy costs and water costs. So now if we have local water um, because we're managing the soil better so we don't need so much water and we're generating local power, our cost of refrigeration, um, our processing is right there. Um, and then mix the human settlement pattern. How do we create communities that work around this so we don't have transportation costs coming in? So what we're looking to do right now is 10 billion dollar sized projects around the world that demonstrate what we call stewardship development. How do we not do silos, but integrate all these uses together in harmony, both from the social side, ecological side, and show that it's a better business model. And we hope, our goal is to be very transparent and hope people copy that as a model around the world. I'm actually really positive that we can make these changes and that business can play not a lagging role, but a leadership role in that. But it's gonna require communities to be behind it and public policies to be behind it to support that as well. Wow, well, it's an ambitious goal, and we at Mountain Film support you in it, and we very much appreciate your contributions to the festival and look forward to having you back. Great. Well, the festival is a wonderful thing. It's a great place to share these ideas and pull like-minded people together to broaden all of our leverage and our resources. So thank you.